student isn't easy. We've all been there. Day in and day out, we go to class, attend lectures, take exams, only to do it again the following semester. As a PhD student in my mid-20s, trust me, I know. Now spending over two decades of my life as a student, or over two-thirds of my life, I've seen the struggle. And with that, it sounds a bit masochistic, doesn't it? Who would do that, right? Well, to make things a little worse, in the years that I wasn't a student, I was a teacher. <laughs> Indeed, being a student is tough, but so is being a teacher. In fact, I never really wanted to become an educator. I think I had just stumbled into academia. You see, I was a business management undergraduate, and I had corporate dreams like anyone else. I was a pretty okay student, and I had, I had kept busy with several extracurricular activities. One of this in my senior year was a case competition hosted by one of the largest multinational companies in the world, well known for several loved brands. And by winning this competition with my team, I had received an interview and eventually a job offer. I still remember the day that they had called me to their office to discuss the contract. The HR manager welcomed me to the small room and she had congratulated me for beating out so many candidates. She reminded me, you know, you're so lucky months before graduation and you already have a job waiting for you. She discussed the terms of the contract. It was definitely very attractive, the salary. And I couldn't help but remember kind of that scene in The Little Mermaid where Ariel is about to sign off her voice. <laughs> With that, there was something in my gut that just d didn't feel right. I remember my hands shaking below the table, thinking, you know, I just couldn't do it. So she, ha she handed me the pen just to sign the contract. And I looked at her and I told her, I think I'll need some time to think about it. Her face was unforgettable. She was like, how could somebody not take this offer, right? And as it turns out, the difference between me and the Little Mermaid, aside from the clam bra, is that I ended up not signing off my voice. Because I thought about what I wanted to do after university. I knew I wanted to make a difference, and for sure I could do that in corporate. I knew I would be learning a lot of skills there and building great networks, but it just wasn't for me. So I went with my instinct, and my instinct told me no and ended up leading me to back to my university. I had inquired with my home university about open, open positions for teaching. The department chair said, we have openings for computer and business statistics. These were subjects that I wasn't particularly crazy about, but I said, sure, I'll do it. And with that, I started my career in education. My parents were definitely not very happy about it. My parents said, you know, we send you to business school and you end up a teacher? How could you possibly reject that job offer? Are you crazy? And one of the things I received most commonly, not just from my parents, but from other people was, what are you doing? And to be honest, they were right. I had no idea what I was doing. I had no answers to any of their questions, but what I did have was a determination, a determination to live out these questions. As I was preparing for my first day in the classroom, I received a lot of advice from different older fa faculty members and older professors who had been teaching lo much longer than I had been alive. And they told me this, don't smile. Don't smile on the first day or even the first month. You can't let your students know how nice you are. In fact, show them who's the boss in the classroom. And as someone with a, with a smile plastered on my face all the time, I found that impossible to do. But more than just appearances, I knew I wanted to change something about how we're taught and how we're being approached by our teachers in the classroom. So I thought about this simple question. How would I have wanted my teacher to be if I were still a student? I wanted my teacher to be kind. I wanted my teacher to be understanding. I wanted them to be patient with me. And most of all, I wanted them to be human. So I set that as my goal. In my school, not everyone dreams of taking business statistics. It was one of the subjects that everyone dreads. And I wanted to get them excited about it because of course, you know, this could be a cool subject. Or maybe that's the nerd in me talking, right? So I, I approached it with enthusiasm and excitement. And 
I told them on my first on my first day, I discussed the syllabus and I tell them my consultation policy. If there's anything that you don't understand, be it the lesson, an example in class, an item on the exam, or say you weren't able to keep up that day because you were tired, you were hungry, you were lacking sleep. I mean, we all know students go through this every day. They can find me in their in my in my office and I will gladly go over the lesson with them one on one and they can ask me anything. More than once, you know, a student would raise their hand and say, "Mom, anything?" And and I say, "Anything." Because these students are so used to hiring private tutors to help them out. When here it was as my job as a teacher to be the one bringing the learning to them as well. I wanted to get that extra effort for them and meet them where they are. So a lot of a lot of teachers have met me with skepticism, you know. They would say we're so overworked and underpaid. Why do you want to work extra hours? And believe me, I knew those extra hours. This is a picture of me, you know, checking and marking piles and piles of papers. That was a typical day as a teacher, you know, we're thinking about le lectures or lesson plans and figuring out how best to deliver our course material. And a lot of them would ask, you know, why go the extra mile for a student who has fallen short? Why? Because a lot of them, these students, they're trying their best and we have to meet them where they are because kindness and understanding saves lives. I'll tell you the story of my student during the first semester I was teaching. Let's call him Enzo. Enzo was a friendly guy who was a one year level older than the rest of his classmates. He sat at the back at the very last row and on the days that he was present and not actively participating in class, I could see him laughing during the quizzes, probably because he already knew he was going to fail them. So as the exam period approached, I saw him one day outside the office, outside the faculty room, waving and smiling and asking if he could come in. He was holding his notes and he said, you know, ma'am, I don't understand anything at all. Could you help me out? And as a teacher with a lot of other things to do, I'm thinking, whew, this is going to be a long afternoon. But I said, sure, let's, let's talk and I'll try to see how I can help you out. And as we're going over the material, trying to review the lessons and the concepts, he starts opening up about his life. He tells me, my life is a mess. His girlfriend had just broken up with him. His, he had no friends to turn to. His family life at home was a mess and nothing was going for him. To make it worse, he was on academic probation, meaning if he had failed my class, he would be kicked out of university. That week, as he was thinking about all these problems that had burdened him so much, he told me that as he was walking along the main avenue outside our university, he thought about throwing himself into the traffic, to the cars, and ending his life right then and there because it simply wasn't worth it. As a statistics teacher, I had no idea what to say or what to do. Who was I to listen to these problems and not know I'm just here to review the lessons, right? I'm here to talk about the null hypothesis, here to talk about statistics, but this was more than just about a textbook lesson. He, he, at that moment, I knew that I had to do something, so I listened. I listened and I reassured him that things will get better, that I promised him this, one day we're going to laugh about this. And as he was calming down, he thanked me for my time that afternoon and left the faculty room. And the moment he was out of sight, I sunk into the office chair and started sobbing. That was the first time I ever cried as a teacher. How could I lecture about statistics and probability when here I had a student who believed they did not have a chance? How can I go about marking and grading exams when my student already thought him of, of himself as a failure? How could I possibly go back to teaching when my, the moment my student steps out of the classroom, nothing matters. This was the moment that I realized that teaching was more than just a job. It was a calling, it was a vocation, it was an embodiment of purpose. A semester later, I, I, as Enzo was about, to, was about to wrap up his senior year, uh, he ended up passing, thankfully, through his own hard work. And as he was about to graduate, I received this message. Passed all my classes, 
and looking forward to the future. I remember feeling like, like so amazing to receive this message. As it turns out, he explains to me that because I had listened to him that day, he realized that he could trust other people. He realized that he ca that is something worth holding on to and that life is still worth it. Eventually, he found a good support system and he, he sought psychological help. And that's the real influence a teacher can have on someone. We think of teachers as people who teach us lessons of, of theories and academic things, but sometimes they can teach us grit, they can teach us hope, they can teach us to believe in ourselves. Recently, I called Enzo up. I asked him how he's doing and if I could share his story with all of you today. He tells me, uh, he tells me that you were right, we're able to laugh about this now. And he told me something that would almost make me cry again. Life hasn't been better. Indeed, with teaching, we create ripples of change. These ripples of change can create an uh, impact on the different things that we do. It can shape careers. It can shape how we go about relating with other people. I know because I also had a professor back when I was, a, when I was an undergrad who changed my life. As an undergrad in my senior year, I was taking a very interesting subject called philosophy of religion. This class was taught by a, a professor who was regarded as a campus legend. And when you have one of those, you know, who like, you know, they're treated like you're so afraid of, of, of wanting to do well in that class and just being, just being in their brilliance, right? So we call this professor Sir Eddie Boy. Sir Eddie Boy was known for his amazing lectures and his warm smile and hearty laughter. And throughout the semester, I learned things about reflecting on my existence, wondering about what my relationships with other people mean to me. But more than that, there was one particular moment throughout the semester that, that still holds very meaningful to me. As we were approaching our final exams, he called on the top student, for, of the top student in a class. And spoiler alert, that student wasn't me. So he called on my friend in front and started grilling him based on everything we've taken up in the semester as a form of review for the rest of the class. My friend answers pretty successfully and my professor says, okay, you can now sit down. And he looks at this big class of 60 people and suddenly he calls on me. He says, Nathaniel, what do you think of your classmates answer? How would you grade it? And I wasn't prepared to say or, or you know, think about anything. I was just listening to his answer. So I, I said, okay, uh, I think my classmate's answer is worth maybe a C plus to B. And I discussed the merits and flaws of his answer. And I gave him advice of how he could improve towards the exam. My professor looked at me and smiled. He said this, Sharp, you could be a teacher. When someone you look up to compliments you, you never forget it for the rest of your life. Whenever things get tough in the classroom, when I'm struggling with students I can't get through, I think of this, that someone once believed in me. And this belief in me turned into me believing into several hundreds of students. I'd only taught for two and a half years before pursuing my PhD here, but in, those very, in that very short time, I had hundreds of students that I tried to make some influence on. These are some of the letters, post-its, and cards that I've received from them in that time. Whenever I read back and try to see their messages of gratitude, of appreciation, I realize that students never forget when you see them as human beings, rather than exams or report cards to be graded. Very rarely do they actually talk about the lessons in class, they don't remember that even when it, during the exam, right? So here they have, they have shown me that what teaching is all about. And it's about these meaningful connections that we make. It's more than just learning. It's about empathy and humanity. And as a teacher, I realized how much influence I had that I could make someone love a subject or hate coming to class. I had the ability to fill them with wonder or make them even lose hope. And with that power, I, th I thought I had to do something with this very importantly. So I thought about that and how influence is created by teachers. I can't understand how anybody could look down on this profession when you have this influence at your hands. 
So whenever someone tells me this, you know, those who can do and those who can't teach, it bothers me, right? How dare you say that about teachers? But in my experience, I started thinking, maybe there are things that I can't do as a teacher. I can't just stand by. I can't stop caring. And most importantly, I can't give up. Not because I can't, but because I refuse to. And as a young educator in the two years that I've been teaching, I realized that there are indeed many things that I can't. But being a real influencer and force for meaningful change isn't one of them. Thank you.